Welcome to Mojo Nation's Play Creators Festival. I'm Deej Johnson, and I'm delighted to say that I'm being joined now for a chat with trademark attorney Victor Caddy from Wynne Jones. Hi, Victor, how are you? Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Are you well? I'm very well, thank you. Yes, enjoying lockdown. Enjoying it's lockdown. It, it's lovely I, summer weather that we're having. I, there was a part of me when we started recording these that thought we, we should be careful not to say we're enjoying lockdown because it'll all be over by the time it goes down. <laughs> There's no chance at all now. <laughs> it's just going on and on and on. But what a delight to, um, to be talking on my part to, uh, to an attorney because I want to and not because I have to. Uh, that's, uh, that makes a refreshing change. Now, whenever anybody says the name Wynne Jones, which is the company you work for, I, I hear the word Wynne. And I think that's usually a, a very reassuring thing uh, to to put in the name of an attorney, um, and of which there's a I don't know if you know this there's a there's a defence lawyer up in Edinburgh called uh, V Good Lawyer. I've always got their number. But uh, for those that don't know, Victor, what is Win Jones, and and what is it that you do there? Uh, Win Jones is a firm of patents and trademark attorneys. So we do intellectual property work in general, patents, trademark design, copyright, uh, licensing. Um, the full spectrum of intellectual property. Um, and I specialize in trademarks and designs and, and the licensing of those rights. So okay. I'm one of the sensible people who isn't a patent attorney. Say that again, sorry? I'm one of the sensible people who isn't a patent attorney. <laughs> right, okay. Well, and in, th in that respect, I suppose that's a good place to start because I know that we're going to be being watched by inventors with various levels of experience. And some of the newer folk, I guess, uh, would be unaware what the differences are between a patent, a trademark, uh, and copyright. Um, so can you run us through the differences between those things? Yeah, there's, it's actually very interesting. People don't know this, but, but really you can divide intellectual property rights into two categories. Uh, on the one hand, you've got um, things like copyright and the equivalent for designs, which is unregistered design right. right. And on the other hand, you've got patents, trademarks, and registered designs, which are different from the unregistered kind. And the, the significant difference between those two, those two categories, is that copyright and unregistered design rights are rights to prevent copying, and mm -hmm. that's it. So you, they're, they're, they're good rights, but they're, they're weak in that sense, because you've got to prove that somebody's copied from you. Whereas right. patents, trademarks, and registered designs are monopoly rights, which means that you have a monopoly, if you're granted one of those things, um, to prevent someone from copying or getting too close to you, regardless of whether they copied or not. Right. So if two people have a, a very similar idea, then patent would protect it because this one looks a little bit like that. Uh, a patent, yes. Well, uh, a patent or a trademark or a design would, 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 would protect you regardless of whether they copied from you. Right, right. Um, interesting. Where, and with copyright, though, that's, that's slightly different because the, the, the right is instantaneous as soon as I've written it. Is that correct? That as the minute I've written it and said, that's what I've written, if I can prove that somebody's copied that, there's no contest. That's correct. And in most countries around the world, you get it automatically from, from the date of creation. OK. So in terms of um, looking at a, a new inventor and where they start, I mean, one thing that comes up, I just can't. It's very difficult, but you can't seem to get a straight answer. And I suppose it's because an awful lot of people have a different take on it. But obviously, I'll be fascinated to hear yours. And that's with something like an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, that um, a lot of advice uh, says that you should have an NDA going to any kind of meeting. Don't do anything. You have an NDA or don't talk. That's, that's absolutely black and white. Other people say an NDA, not worth the paper. It's printed on, don't bother. Uh, in fact, there is one school of thought and I heard somebody say it quite recently that said, oh, I just would never embarrass myself or the other party by asking for an NDA. And I think, well, you wouldn't say that because you've never, <laughs> you've never needed an NDA. And, <laughs> and, and, and it's that saying, isn't it, that you don't need an NDA until you need an NDA and then it's too late. So, so what rights are protected by an NDA, for example? Well, an NDA is, is effectively a contract. So it, it's somebody signing up and saying that if you disclose this to us, we won't uh, we won't do something that we're, we're not entitled to do with it. Um, so it, it's basically a, a contract a good agreement between you and them. Um, as with all these things, the difficulty is, as you say, it's, it's a question of trust in the relationship and also um, whether or not you're in a position to enforce something at the end of the day, because enforcing a contract isn't easy. You don't you have to go to the court if you want to enforce something. So somebody could sign an NDA and if they're really unscrupulous, just ignore it and, and call your bluff and, and assume that you'll never you'll never seek to enforce it against them 
Yeah, so, so so presumably I'd need quite deep pockets to to enforce an NDA if I felt somebody had done something um, untoward. Yeah, that's exactly right. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, and also, it's it's never it's very, or very seldom anyway is it black and white. You know, somebody may sign an NDA and then produce something that that is a bit similar to what you've disclosed to them, but not identical. Um, mm. And then they'll argue, well, it wasn't covered by the NDA. No, that's, uh, that actually is where I think it gets very, very difficult indeed. You're absolutely right, because if I show somebody an idea and say, well, the, the, the mechanism for the game is this, uh, and then the idea is almost identical, but the mechanism of the game has changed, presumably I've got nothing. I, I, I'm stuffed with or without an NDA. Yeah, but that's, that's not, you, this is another very interesting point, actually. <laughs> it's going well here. Um, <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> don't realize this is absolutely fundamental and that is that, that there's no protection for an idea um, the law protects the manifestation of an idea not 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 an idea per se that's um, yes that's it you said that in a very well that's a very um, nicely phrased way of putting it there's no protection of an idea they protect the manifestation of an idea so i uh, yes which, which i suppose is is sensible because it's reasonable isn't it with the number of people in the world uh, that it, it's completely unreasonable to assume that I'm the only person capable of having a certain thought. Uh, that would be preposterous. But the execution of that idea is is more enshrined in law uh, than the actual idea itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. I mean, I think this is interesting. Uh, if, you, if you consider toys and games here, there's quite an interesting distinction between toys and games. I think. And, and, and what, yes, what is the distinction between toys and games? Because they are very different animals, aren't they? Yeah, they are actually. And I think it's because. Um, with with toys, um, somebody who sets out to to plagiarise is really looking to plagiarise the, manu the the manifestation of an idea. Mm -hmm. So really, they want to get as close as possible. They might they're probably going to use the same name, and they're probably going to have an identical product. So we're really talking counterfeiting. Yes. Um, and um, so, if as a toy inventor, you've got your your trademark protected, and also your design protected. Um, then you've got the tools you need to counter counterfeiting, as it were. Um, <laughs> now with games, it's different, I think, because people don't usually copy the manifestation of an idea. They don't copy the game, the actual physical manifestation of the game. They copy the idea of the game. So they'll probably use a different name and they'll put it in a different box, different artwork. And what's in the box will probably be different as well. Um, right. But it's the same game you're playing with the same objectives and the same rules. Yes. Um, so would this be teetering into that territory that I suppose for want of a better turn of phrase, we would be calling copycat, where somebody has has sort of said, well, that I'm trying so hard not to say a name or anything. <laughs> so I don't want to get into trouble. But you, you'll sort of say, well, that look, I've seen that on the shelf of the entertainer for, for argument's sake. Um, and that's a wonderful game. But if I take that and I take out some of the some of the patented technology inside it that makes the game work, I can change the name of it slightly. I can approximate the gameplay, but maybe change one or two tiny little things. Yeah. And then arguably that shop might have uh, something on the shelf similar that, that would be described as a, as a copycat. And I can almost hear Bill flinching in the background. <laughs> of course, there are other toy shops. Uh, I'm saying for argument's sake that you could walk into any toy shop and see something on the shelf and see that there like that. So, so where are we on that? That would be a copycat as opposed to exactly a counterfeit. Right. That's exactly right. I think, I think as a general rule, there's not much point in being a copycat of toys. It's, it's really counterfeiting is where it's at with toys if, you're, if you want to benefit from somebody else's investment, incremental investment. Um, yes, and, and, I, and I guess a, a, count, a counterfeit then would be defined as something that is just, just that is passing itself off as as the original. It's just outright ripping you off. The counterfeiter wants you to think that this is the original product you're getting. Mm. You're getting a bargain because it's cheaper. Yeah. Right. And do you know, out of interest, I, I I wonder about the and this may be a bad year to ask the question because God knows what the figures are like this year. I, I don't even know how we can keep track of anything. But in terms of the costs to uh, an industry in terms of counterfeiting, have you any idea what those ballpark figures are? Uh, I know I don't know quantitatively, but I know they're they're, they're massive. I know it's a really big problem, um, uh, and this is why you've got people like Amazon who are actually waking up to this and. and making initiatives now to to try and stamp out on, on counterfeiting. Yes, they, they quite recently announced something, didn't they? I'm not quite sure I read the detail on that, but they quite recently announced that they were really cracking down on it. It's, they're going to crack down, they're going to be more vigilant about not stopping um, or taking down counterfeit products. Because it does happen that you can order something online 
and it appears to be with a reputable supplier. And the thing that turns up, and actually I know Bananagrams, I'm sure, I'm sure Bananagrams of all companies won't mind me saying this, that they've had um, many occasions where they'll, they'll have a complaint on, on Amazon or sent directly to them where it'll say, well, we bought this and, and it's in, it, the, the condition is not what we hope, the quality is very poor, and it's just an outright blatant ripoff. And you can often tell because, you know, the word Bananagrams has been spelled wrong and uh, the tiles have got holes in the back. They're so cheap. They're so miserable. And they're so wretched. But I can never quite work out where, where in the line the counterfeit is coming from because it appears to have been ordered reputably. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a bit of a dark art, I think, counterfeiting. Um, and of course, the worst, the worst sort of scenario is where the, the, the purchaser, the, the member of the public, doesn't actually realise that it's a counterfeit product they've got. Yeah. And then, and then the, the all the problems, all the all the you know breaks, uh, that all reflects badly on the on the, the, the genuine product. And presumably, something I hadn't really given much thought to, but it would be very important would be that if if it's just an outright rip off, then the safety of that product is going to be uh, highly dubious. I would imagine there's a there's a great problem with, with because that's how they're doing it cheap. They're cutting out all of these standards. That, that's exactly right, and it goes from things like lead paint to sharp bits of metal nails that, that drop off and you know all kinds of things that, that potentially are dangerous yeah oh gosh yes i had oh gosh i hadn't really thought about that of course lead paint would be a it yeah that would be a terrible thing like that yeah yeah it, it is a it is a really serious problem worldwide yeah and going back to what we were talking about with the um with the copycats earlier because that's something that win jones has got a, a great interest in in fact i think the last time we spoke you and i um was probably about a year ago i think we very briefly passed each other i think you were on the way to the, to the stage to talk about the coffee cup which i missed um, but where are you with that and what, what and what was the initiative the uh yes you're absolutely right the uh the initiative is is, is um the code of conduct that we're working on um and, and it, it stems from exactly what we're talking about it's the fact that, that whereas um toys have a degree of protection because most copying with toys is, is proper counterfeiting the protection for games is, is much Weaker. The, the, what I mean by that is that the law doesn't really protect the scenario that, 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 that game inventors find themselves in, um, which is that people want to copy the idea, not the manifestation of the idea. Mm -hmm. um, so intellectual property rights doesn't really help them. Somebody can just choose a different name. Um, uh, it, it can be a, it can allude to the same thing, but it's, as long as it's different, it's not a trademark infringement. They can put it in a different box. They can use the same color scheme, so it looks the same. But as long as the artwork is different, again, there's no there's no copyright infringement. And then what's in the box can be, again, as I say, the same game, but it can be set up in, in and look totally different. Mm. It, can, it can resemble it, it can be the same colour schemes and so on, but as long as it's something different, there's, again, there's no, there's, no, there's no copyright or design infringement going on. Um, so, so the law doesn't really protect game inventors very well. Um, and um, th this industry being, being sort of the nice, friendly industry that it is, um, I, I know that you know that doesn't sit well with a lot of people. Um, yeah. And even, even some of the retailers um, who, who stock copycat games um, don't feel entirely comfortable with the fact that they're doing it. Um, mm. So the code of conduct is 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 basically a, um, an idea to to um, help the the industry take control of the situation itself. Um, and the idea is that people will be a voluntary code. People would sign up to it. Um, and I suppose that. The, Essentially, you, 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 it, it probably would, there would be some sort of badge, probably, that people could apply to their products or to their websites and so on to say that they were members of the scheme. And I think the easiest way for people to understand it is to think of it as something a little bit like the fair trade logo that you see in the supermarkets. Right. Um, people will know then the difference between the original game and the copycat game that come later. Uh, whereas at the moment, they might be faced with two games and one of them is slightly cheaper than the other one. Um, they will have a choice in the future because they'll know which is the genuine one. Um, and uh, it may well be as well that, that, that retailers would only uh, retailers who sign up to this the code of conduct would only um, uh, um, uh, stock the products bearing the badge, not not the not the, the sort of copy of ones that don't. Um, so it would be a voluntary thing, but I think if, if it was to um, affect people's behaviour, both people within the industry and also members of the purchasing public's behaviour, which is is what the fair trade symbols mm. do. Mm. Um, then it could be very successful in terms of um, uh, avoiding that that, um, that 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 problem that we have at the moment that, that games just just don't get the protection they deserve. 
Yes, and, and I suppose the argument against it is that, that obviously to some extent people are going to have that option and say, well, we want to provide the same gameplay experience, and they may not say it that way, but we want to play a, a similar gameplay experience, uh, but we want to have a cost-effective option uh, for people at the, the lower end of the, the earning demographic. I'm making these words up. Yeah. Uh, and that might well be the you know, that would be what would seem to me to be a very obvious catch-all defence for really just ducking the issue and cheating an inventor out of, out of, yeah. out of his slice of the money. Which is, which is, I suppose, the problem is you can defend an awful lot of this with words, but when you really think that it's at the end of it all, there is an inventor who had a lovely idea, invested in it, pitched it, got it to market, licensed it, really worked on it, and now that person's not getting money out of somebody else doing the copycat version of it. Um, yeah, exactly. like they're losing money to it, aren't they? Yeah. So in terms, of, in terms of how can retailers and inventors support the code of conduct, what is it that we would like them to be doing? Well, it's, 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 it's got to be um, industry driven. Um, it, it's it's going to work if the industry supports it. Um, so what we're looking for at the moment is, is both active support and passive support. So we want to, we, we want to know if people really support it, and, and, and anecdotally we've been told they really do support it passively. Mm. Um, they're, they're very keen on it, and they'd like to see something in place. Um, one or two people have, have questions over how effective it will be, but, but I think some of those can be answered. Um, but we're also looking for active support in that we really want people from the industry to come forward and help us um, say what, what, what should be in the code, how it should operate, um, and help us to basically to, to sort of follow the theme, manifest the idea, as it were. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I might rip it off. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good idea. Um, no, that's, that's exactly right. And I suppose that's the problem there, is that people that would be sitting back and more or less sort of saying, well, I don't see how this could work, or I, I don't see how you would solve this problem, uh, those people would presumably not be coming forward and, and sort of trying to support you. Whereas you need them to come forward and say, well, I have questions about that in, in order to address those very points. So yeah. the first thing that people would do is, is get in touch to say, well, I, I want to support it. How can I support it? That's yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. And, and the more uh, constructive criticism we have, the more vigorous we can make it. Yeah. Yes, I, I think you're right. I think that's exactly right. And I think, it's, and actually, if you, in a very intuitive way, this would be like doing uh, a critique of a game. So if an inventor has done a game, that they have to go through that part of the process where they rip it to shreds and say, this bit doesn't work, this part is terrible, we have to knock this into shape, we have to do this. You have to identify the problems in order to problem solve. And I think that's, as far as I can make out, where we are with the code of conduct. It's got problems and it needs people talking about those problems in order to help solve them. That's exactly right. But I think the timing is right as well, because you know, we were just talking about Amazon and, and their um, uh, initiative as far as anti-counterfeiting is concerned. Um, I think the timing is right, because when we first launched the idea of the Code of Conduct uh, about a year ago, um, one of the comments I had was, well, it'll, it, it'll, you'll need to have Amazon on side in order to make it work. Uh, um, yeah. Which is actually a fair comment, um, but yeah. I think we can get them on side, because I think they are moving in that direction now. Yes, and, and, of, and of course, with, with the, uh, not to harp on about COVID, but with the damage to the high street so palpable, I mean, it wasn't, uh, high street was not doing a, a, an enormously, uh, it was not an enormously happy place before the pandemic. And now that we, we've seen what we've seen, I, 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 you know, Amazon, 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 Amazon. So uh, Amazon have chosen a very good time to be making moves in this direction because it's becoming more important. And I have heard purely anecdotally some people that were very reluctant to shop on Amazon. They, they like the process of the high street. They want to shop in the high street. Uh, but when they've tried to venture back after the lockdown relaxed, uh, they found themselves, and, and this is not, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is not in any way criticizing the position we're in. We're in this position. Um, they're walking down the high street. They've got a few bags and they have to put sanitizer on their hands in every shop. And they're more or less taking their shopping and they're passing it from hand to hand. They're trying to, oh, this, uh, putting it down. Above. Well, it's already on the back. They're doing nothing. And a friend of mine said recently, she's not going back to the high street until this is completely done. 
she's going to do it all online. So Amazon have chosen the right time, I think, to, to step up. And indeed, uh, since that was, um, I wouldn't describe it as a stumbling block, but I think, it was a, I think it was a concern unexpressed among some people. And until you get Amazon on board um, or, or making strides in that direction, perhaps, that it would be a difficult thing to do. But since they have, um, that's quite a quantum leap forward. But I also think, going back to the point you made earlier, Amazon's problem, if, it, if such as they have problems, is that they need, they, need, they need people to have confidence in their products, in the products that, they, that are sold on their platform. Mm. Um, and so something like the code of conduct with a, a badge that, that identifies genuine products uh, will give customers that, or consumers that, that, that confidence. Yes, that's a really good point, actually, because I think one of the, one of the flaws in Amazon as a well and in all online shopping but amazon is the one that leaps to mind uh is that they have that sort of five star review rating and that in itself is not a problem but there are as i've had conversations with people for mojo nation before there are problems with that five star review if somebody has mooched along and sort of said well uh, the postman bought this late for timmy's birthday one star that has nothing to do with the product they're reviewing the service not the product uh, you get a certain number of people who say this is absolutely fantastic did everything it was supposed to and they'll give it one star uh, because they i don't know why i mean i don't understand how they could be <laughs> thinking it's just you know i don't know it's the tip top it's the it's the number one maybe that's what they're thinking it's the number one so they click on one but here a lot of the issues that you get with people saying one star this is a cheap nasty product without realizing it's a counterfeit, which was your point earlier, they don't know it's a counterfeit. Uh, that would go away, presumably, because you've got that badge saying it, it, it is absolutely not. You would know that it's a counterfeit product or not a counterfeit product uh, when, that, when that review appeared. Uh, so that, yeah, I think that's important. And in terms, Victor, of some of the other big misconceptions about IP, I was gonna ask earlier, we were on a big detour. In terms of the big misconceptions about IP, are there any others that you're able to dispel easily? Um. Um, I or, or, or not that easily, Victor. I don't care if you have to work. What's it bother me? <laughs> I don't. I don't give a monkey's to you. <laughs> However hard it is. <laughs> I think. Um, uh, I think the fact that, that you don't have protection for an idea, um, you get protection for manifestation ideas, is, is one big. I think the fact that, that IP isn't all equal. You know, you have monopoly rights on the one hand, which are stronger than than, than, than copying rights on the other. Is another, um, maybe not a misconception, but a, 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 something that people don't always appreciate. Um, and I suppose, um, I suppose that following on from that is 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 the inevitable issue about cost and the fact that people always think that IP is expensive. Mm. Um, and I know you'll probably, be, you know, people will be saying, "Oh, well, he would say that, wouldn't he?" But but um, <laughs> but, but you um, would. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is, if you want if you want monopoly rights, then you've got to pay to get them. Um, yeah, because you've got to go through an examination process to 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 to, to where, where the, the government basically checks whether or not you're entitled to a monopoly. But but the protection you get at the end of it is so strong. You know, monopoly, imagine having a monopoly right. Um, that's an incredibly strong position to be in. Mm -hmm. um, and I can guarantee that every single business that exists, that the the, the 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 thing that is most valuable about their business is their intellectual property. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's not so common these days, but it's one of the big mergers to happen. But, but in the 80s, when there were lots of very big mergers, um, there were things like the um, Nestle buying Round Trees confectionery in York. And they paid, I forget what it was exactly, but it was something like two thirds to three quarters of the price that they paid was for the names, um, which was, you know, Yorkie, Quality Street, Kit Kat, Aero, things like that. Wow. Um, they paid so much more for the names than they paid for the, the, the massive factory. Yeah. Um, and because it's 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 the name seems like property that where the value is, um, and you know I, I can totally understand why businesses cut budgets and, and cut out IP um, because you don't need to have the IP. But if you can put a budget towards it, then then it's it's money well spent because what you're put, what you're getting is something much more valuable at the end of it. Yes, and, and in that respect, then let me ask you this because I th I think it is a difficult question. Therefore, it would be a matter of opinion, but I'm interested in your opinion. As a new inventor, how soon is too soon to start looking at IP? Oh, uh, that's a very good question. Um, and it is a difficult one to answer, actually, I think, because um, as an inventor, you probably have a, a plan in mind where you'd ideally like to sell your, 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 your toy or game to someone who would take on um, the, 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 the expense and the process of getting the intellectual property protected. Um, 
So what you really want is, is, is a, a baseline protection that will um, safeguard what you've got so that um, those people can, can take it on and, and, and secure the, the, the protection later on. So what you need to do is avoid losing that protection, basically. Uh, right. And then there's an interesting point there because uh, uh, there, is, there is a potential banana scheme coming up for, for inventors who are in that position with Brexit. Um, mm. and, and from the, the 1st of January... 2021, so very soon, in fact. All right, okay. And so, so Brexit obviously uh, has um, massive implications in so many areas. In terms of uh, changing, what is it that people then need to do to protect IP in in terms of Brexit? And did you say 2021? This is January coming up. Yep, yep. Just around the corner. Just around the corner. It's because we've wasted the whole of 2020. We've done nothing. <laughs> nothing at all has got yeah, done. Exactly. <laughs> Sneaked up on us now. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, let, let's look at that. But, I mean, the, the first thing is that, that from January, um, so, so a few months' time, um, the, e, the UK will, will, be, will leave the EU trademark and design systems. Um, right. So EU trademarks and designs will no longer cover the UK, um, which means that, that going forwards to get protection in both the EU and the UK, you're going to need to get protect. You're going to need to register your trademark and your, your design in, in, in both countries separately. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a um, you know that, that's an inconvenience. I suppose it's not, probably not the end of the world, but it's an inconvenience. Um, but I think for, from um, the, the issue for a, for an inventor is is that if you're you know probably at the initial stage you're going to be relying on on things that are cheap. So you're going to be relying on the copyright or the design unregistered design right. Mm -hmm. um, now. And at the moment, and up until the end of this year, as far as designs are concerned, in the UK you get two lots of unregistered design right. You've got the UK unregistered design right, and you've got the, the, the European Union's equivalent, which is community unregistered design right. Right. Um, and because the UK is still part of those systems, um, you get double protection because the, those two unregistered design rights are not the same. But after, or, or from January, um, uh, you you will only get the UK design right if you uh, are a UK inventor and you disclose your your toy or game in the UK first, um, because we'll no longer be part of the EU system. So you won't get the community design right at the same time. And but but by disclosing your design in the UK, you will lose the novelty of the design in in other territories, because design right only comes for something that's novel. Uh, yeah. That's right. Now, so that means that potentially, if you're a, an inventor of a toy or a game, um, and you uh, make your design public in the UK, you'll have protection in the UK as unregistered design right, but you won't have protection in the EU anymore, um, unless you disclose it on the same day in the EU, if you see, because you have to have this novelty thing, you have yeah. to disclose in both the EU and the UK on the same day. Now, in the past, that hasn't been necessary because we're in, in the EU. Yes, yes. So presumably, I mean, to, to help fight that, we've got to we've got to get our ducks in the row and, and just make sure that when we, we because if I hear you right, as soon as we publish it in the UK, it, it is no longer considered novelty. That's exactly right. In the EU. Gosh, that's horrendous. So you've either got to pub, you've basically got to try and publish on the same day in both the UK and the EU. Yeah. Um, I hadn't I hadn't heard that. I, I, I guess that's one of those things that because it's uh, it is so sort of well, it's the least glamorous part of invention, isn't it? It's all well and good sitting there and having an idea. And I know Billy Dangsworthy certainly has a little novelty. He's um, he's always talking about it. Um, but if you're if you're publishing that and sort of people are saying, uh, if you're saying these things and 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 that's published and and then in in fact because you publish that you don't realise that there's a you're you're opening it up. It's open season on the rest of your idea. That's right. Exactly right. Um, Gosh. And what you need to do if you, if in order to re re retain the um, attractiveness to a purchaser is make sure that you don't lose that protection in the EU because obviously they're going to want you to have protection everywhere. Um, yes. So that may, as I say, may, may mean finding a way of publishing both in the UK and the EU on the same day, or it may mean filing a, um, a design application, an application to register the design, um, which gives you a right of priority um, so that you can file in the UK and then file in the EU later, but claim the same data in the UK. Mm, mm. It do, I mean, that, that, I hadn't heard about that at all. So I, I suppose that's a very good thing to start flagging for people because that's qu quite on top of it. But if people haven't heard, 
uh, then that's something that needs I, I would have thought quite a, quite a lot of urgent attention it's just not it's just not that far away. Yeah, that's right exactly. yeah. yeah interesting and let's so, let make some i mean they may change may, may make some changes and make the eu some have some, some sort of reciprocal relationship with the uk but at the moment there is this this risk yeah yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not going all that well, is it? In terms of setting up reciprocal, <laughs> it'll all be fine. It's not yeah. really. <laughs> it's not. It's not. The temperature of the water is not what they were promising. Um, good, interesting. And um, so, th is there anything else in terms of uh, upcoming change that you think would be relevant for uh, either retailers or, or or inventors to hear about? I think it's, it's, it's all publishers. I'm so sorry. All publishers, of course, is the other thing that's. that's yeah. It's all, it's all still Brexit, even though our minds have been on other things at the moment, but it's, it's Brexit is still the big, the big thing coming up. Um, and I think really for, for, the, for the design, for, the, for the, the, um, the, the, the touring game industry, which relies heavily on licensing, I think, I think that one of the crucial things is, is, is not so much the fact that the people are going to have to register separately in the EU and the UK going forward. It's, it's more the question of making sure that the licenses are effective in both the, U, the UK and the EU. Um, because hitherto you just had one license that's covered the EU and that's covered the UK and the rest of the EU. Um, but going forwards, um, obviously that's not going to be the case and the UK can diverge from the EU in terms of things like regulation, and tax, things like that. So having a single license isn't going to be quite as easy. Mm. Um, another thing that can happen quite easily is that, that you, if you have a UK right separate from an EU right, a trademark for example, um, then you could end up with a, a UK registration, a trademark registration that covers a, diff, a slightly narrower range of goods, products from the from the EU one. Um, and again, you need to make sure that, that the products you've got protection for are the ones that are covered by your your license in both territories. Mm -hmm. um, you could even, by accident, end up with a a UK trademark that's owned by a different company within your group from the EU trademark. Um, and so you've got to make sure you know there are all kinds of little pitfalls that, I'm, that, that are bound to come out in the wash eventually. Yeah, I can't work out whether you're frustrated by that or, or whether that's <laughs> just rubbing my hands. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> a bit of both, I think. That's <laughs> uh, we would far sooner, we'd far sooner get the prevention rather than the cure. I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think attorneys and lawyers they 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 understandably get excited over over a, a, a certain level of detail that other people are like, I don't know what's going on I don't understand it at all um, but that's your bread and butter this is uh, this is this is how you make uh, this is how you make a living and how the world makes sense unfortunately it's quite it's quite hard work for the rest of us uh, very good so now in terms of uh, people reaching out and getting in touch um, with you Victor if people want to hear more about the code of conduct or if people want to drop your line and find out whether they're prepared for Brexit, I don't know why I said prepared like that. I don't know what happened there. Prepared, I said, uh, like Kenneth Williams. No. But if uh, people want to be better prepared for Brexit, they want to get in touch about the code of conduct, they want to find out anything, anything else about IP, what's the best way to get in touch? Uh, I can be contacted by email very easily. Um, my email, should I give my email address? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you, if you oh, give it, we'll, we'll block me out and it'll come up here. Okay, perfect. That's <laughs> ideal. <laughs> <laughs> My, my email address is victor.paddy, which is C-A-D-D-Y, and it's at win, W-Y-N-N-E, hyphen jones.com. I'm glad and you I, spelled so, win. Yeah. I'm glad you spelled win because I misled people earlier by making it sound like it was the word win, but yes. <laughs> W-Y-N-N-E. Yeah. Very good. And I can also be contacted by phone um, on um, 01242 Brilliant. My God, he actually gave us his phone number. That, I think that was Swedish. Uh, I know some of the people who will be watching this. They're just huge time wasters. Uh, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be <laughs> calling and <laughs> honking like geese. That's all they do. Um, th three hours a day. They do it. We don't know why. Uh, brilliant. Uh, Victor, I want to thank you so very much for your time. This has been a great pleasure. Always a delight to catch up with you. I, I do find uh, the things that you know are fascinating. It's like peeling an onion. Oh, well. Layer after layer, and it all ends in tears. That's that's <laughs> <laughs> great pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Victor. Thank, Thank you. you.